dommage et décollage. Hello and welcome to this live webcast brought to you by Ariane Space for our sixth mission of the year and our return to flight for our light launcher Vega. A very special mission tonight, no less than 53 satellites on board Vega for this very first rideshare mission for Ariane Space. With me on set here in Paris. Beatrice Romero, she is a program director for Ariane Space. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you and good evening. And here to my right, Alexandre Dallonneau. He is a system manager for Vega and Vega C. And Alexandre will be with us throughout the evening to take us through all the milestones of this mission. Thanks for being with us. Thank you too and good evening. And for the French speakers among you, uh, you can follow a live and real-time uh, translation thanks to our interpreters, Mark Fermin and Alexandre Carayon. Over now to Kourou, where our launcher is waiting on the pad with our passengers safe and sound under the fairing. And straight over to Mission Control, where our CEO, Stéphane Israel, is heading up the flight desk. Good evening, Stéphane. Uh, how are things going in Kourou? And can you please introduce us Good to evening, your team please. there? Yes, so we are now in the Jupiter uh, Control Center and we are in the flight cell. So I have uh, with me my uh, colleagues. Uh, so we have uh, Bruno Gerard, who is uh, at the head of our uh, establishment here in Guyana. We have uh, Julio Renzo, who is the CEO of uh, Avio, our prime contractor for this launch. And we have Pierre Tissier, who is our deputy uh, chief technology uh, officer. And uh, so, as we were saying, a uh, uh, very first uh, rideshare mission here for Ariane Space. Can you tell us more about this new offer? Yes, it's very important because tonight is a real premiere. For the first time in Europe, we will have a mission which will embark 53 satellites in the same launcher with uh, Vega. And this is a new offer which is dedicated to this emerging segment of the market, the small satellite between a few uh, grams to uh, 200 uh, kilo. So a very impressive offer, which will be giving access to space to a whole new range of customers. Uh, the launch, unfortunately, was postponed several times. Can you take us through these delays? Yes, so we have had to uh, reschedule the launch because uh, in March we have had uh, the pandemic and everyone has understood that we have to take uh, special measures and so we have had to slow down a little bit our activities. In June, uh, we were uh, ready uh, to come back to the launch pad with our customers and with the launcher, but unfortunately, due to uh, negative high altitude winds, it was not possible to launch. But what I can tell you tonight is that the weather is with us and uh, as you can see on the control screen, the weather is green. That is uh, fantastic news. Uh, good to hear it from you, uh, Stefan. Uh, tonight also marks, of course, Vega's return to flight, as we were saying. Yes, so it was a little more than uh, one year ago. We have had uh, an anomaly with Vega after uh, an impressive uh, tempo of successes. It is uh, things which can happen in our business. We have uh, perfectly understood with all, uh, with all our partners, with uh, ISA, with Avio, the root cause of the anomaly. And tonight we are ready for the launch. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Stefan, for joining us. I know uh, this is a very busy time for you. Uh, we are some 10 minutes uh, to lift off, so we're going to let you get back to your teams and back to work. Thank you for taking time out, and uh, we'll be back uh, with you just after our second separation. That's in uh, about an hour's time. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us, and we'll be back speaking to you in about an hour's time. Thank you, Elise. Thank you, Stefan.
And uh, uh, Beatrice, as we were saying, uh, it's been a, a very eventful year here. Tonight we're launching VV16 and you're already working on uh, the next uh, flight, aren't you? Yes, that's correct. I'm, flying, I'm working already on VV17. And for VV16, we are really very proud to be here today because we have overcome all kinds of adversities. As Stefan just explained, the first launch attempt was in March, and the campaign was put on hold just 10 days before the launch due to the lockdown that was imposed by the pandemic of the COVID. And then, despite the, all the, these difficulties that we had during the, the sanitary crisis, we resumed the launch campaign for a new attempt in June. And at that time, the weather was, was not on our side, definitely. And even yesterday, we have another unexpected weather event. So here we are now for V16 and also preparing the next Vega launch for uh, hopefully in November. So uh, as always in space, looking to the future and uh, back to tonight's mission here. So as I was saying to you, Alexandre is going to be taking us through all the milestones. Can you please tell us about the key moments to look out for, please? Of course, Liz. So um, following the, the liftoff from CSG, the first solid booster stage, P80, starts the mission with a flight duration less than two minutes. The second and the third stages, Zephyro 23 and Zephyro 9, will increase the launcher velocity with the help of their own propellant consumption and their respective separations. After 6 minutes and 30 seconds, the launcher reaches hypersonic velocity around Mach 11 at 200 km altitude. The Avuma per stage will ignite its engine for the first time, operating for about 8 minutes targeting orbit conditions. After a first long ballistic phase, a reignition occurs for about one minute and a half, prior to releasing the first seven satellites at 515 km. At this stage, Liz, we will end the webcast, but of course you can follow the, on social media the rest of the mission. Customer sequence will end by releasing the 46 CubeSat 15 km higher after two short avum boost durations and a second long ballistic phase. Then, for uh, the, the total mission customer duration, it will be on, uh, for this mission one hour and 45 minutes. Thank you very much for all these explanations. Alexa, we'll be back uh, speaking to you very soon. Beatrice, uh, you work alongside the customers on uh, a lot of these missions. Uh, when it comes, there's a very uh, precise campaign for each mission. And uh, of course, it all preparations take place uh, at the Kourou Space Center, the CSG, which is actually a, a very large area, the size of New York City more than 700 uh, kilometers square. So can you maybe take us for a, a bird's eye oversight of uh, the Vega facilities, the facilities that are being used uh, here in the, for this particular mission? Yeah, sure. So here we have the payload processing facilities. These are the buildings where the satellites are prepared for launch. This is the aerial view of the S5 building that is one of the most advanced payload facilities in the world. It allows us having several launch campaigns in parallel, as there are two holes for the standalone operations and two other buildings, uh, those blocks that we can see on the, on the left side of the screen, for the hazardous operations like the propellant fillings. Other facilities for VEGA, and now we are going to see as well uh, the VEGA Launch Control Center. So this is the place where the launch vehicle operations are, are managed. And it's a common building for the Ariane and the VEGA launchers. It's very near to the launch pad, isn't it? Yeah, it's very close to the launch pad. And now we are going to have the view of the launch pad, very nice view. And the launch vehicle is directly integrated inside, so in this, in this pad. And the payload composite joins the launcher when it's encapsulated. And all those operations are performed inside the mobile gantry that we can see there. The gantry is not there now because it has been rolled out about three hours before liftoff. This is the entrance of the launch base with the Jupiter uh, 2, that is the mission control center. It's situated just on the right side of, at the entrance. 
and we will see more images of the inside of this building because all uh, our management is there. And Galio, which is uh, the tracking station, the first one that will receive the first telemetries, the first part of the telemetry of the, of the launcher is located in La Montagne de Père, about uh, 20 kilometers from the launch base. Thank you very much, Beatrice. So uh, here we have an oversight of uh, what is going on there in Kourou. I was telling you, Alexandra will be taking us through the key moments of the mission, but you will also be hearing another voice throughout the evening, and that is the voice of the range operations manager in Mission Control. His name is Raymond Bois. Uh, he is called, in French, he's called the DDO, and he is the person whose voice uh, will be calling out all these major milestones. We're actually coming up to one right now, Alexandra, aren't we? At uh, four minutes, we should hear the start of what they call the synchronized Artus sequence. DDO. Attention pour la séquence finale lanceur. Top à 0 moins 4 minutes. So, you can so hear. what does that mean, Alexander? <laughs> yes, so it's uh, it's an important uh, milestone. This um, all of system representative of the range, the launcher, and upper part are green. And uh, we can continue until the start of the automated sequence uh, 30 seconds before liftoff. Uh, in other words, uh, it's a medical examination before our hiring. And as you can see, we are LC and ready to carry out the job. So our Vega is ready to go. Yes. Right, OK. So um, another uh, piece that you can't miss in mission control, uh, if we go back to the pictures uh, of the Jupiter control of the Jupiter uh, control center, is uh, the giant screen that towers over uh, the teams there, the operational teams. And uh, it is called the status panel. We'll be going over to it shortly. And as Alexander was saying, uh, all the markers are green on that status panel. What does it reflect? So yes, uh, you can see on the screen as uh, a global status panel, we have all the subsystem coming uh, from the launch base, giving the status towards uh, the mission control center. Uh, on one hand, you have the range representative of the safety criteria, the logistic and ground mains. On the other hand, uh, the launcher helps with electrical and mechanical checks. Finally, the upper part checks, including SSMS dispenser and satellite status. Um, Liz, as a traffic light, it is a green. You can go. It is red. You should stop. Absolutely. And um, so you will be able, of course, to take us through these uh, moments thanks to your expertise, but also thanks to the information you'll be receiving through your earpiece. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, I'm connected directly to our uh, colleague in Kourou, uh, in Kourou CVI by uh, this uh, earpiece. It's the same information the DDO is receiving, is exactly, that right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So uh, this team received uh, all Vega flight parameters uh, in Galio, as mentioned by Beatrice. They have three panels focused on propulsion parameters, guidance navigation and control activations, and trajectory. Head of CVI will, uh, will synthesize um, their respective and numerous feedbacks uh, in real time, transmitting information to the DDO. Mm. And so this information that there are uh, many, many parameters, hundreds of parameters being collected, and of course they can't all be analyzed in real time, so uh, the proper uh, deep analysis will start as of the day after the launch, as exactly. far as I understand. Exactly, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. And, uh, and this information will be used for the next launches. Yes, you will, you will receive all this experience for this, from this flight and you will apply uh, all positive feedback to, uh, to improve the next flight. Of course. And so uh, it looks like we're coming up to uh, another milestone. The DDO's voice uh, calling out the one minute mark, I believe. Top I zero minus one minute. So there we go. Yes, so ago. the flags are green. Weather status is good. We are getting uh, closer to the automated sequence, and uh, I'm keeping my finger crossed. Well, <laughs> uh, we're all uh, crossing our fingers here in Paris. Uh, we're going to wish everyone good luck and sit back and enjoy the launch. We'll be back with you shortly. À tous de DDO, attention pour le décompte final. Dix, neuf, huit, sept, six, cinq, 
4, 3, 2, 1, top Allumage P4, Allumage Yes. It's How does it feel? Your 15th? Very exciting and, and, and moving at the same time. Uh -huh. uh, it's, uh, really, it's a Vega Rebirth. Because you, apart from the first one, you have always been there? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, from the, from the second flight. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, can, uh, you can admire uh, the liftoff on the launch and acceleration the when we did the first stage go, P80, with an average thrust of two, 230 tons for a launch of total mass roughly twice less. This is what gives Vega this particular feeling of acceleration. Very impressive, uh, Beatrice. I mean, you are used to seeing these takeoffs. It's, it's something else, isn't it? I was used to, to see those takeoffs, but always inside the Jupiter, so never outside. So, but it's really very impressive to see any anyway in the screen. So, uh, Alexandre, uh, take us through uh, a lot of. Uh, a lot of, uh, we were just listening to du P80. the DDO announcing a lot of milestones taking place in very quick succession. Please take us through it. Yes, now it's the tail off of the first stage, it's confirmed by the DDO. And, uh, and now the separation of the first stage is confirmed. So, approximately the ignition of the second one, named 0223, it is confirmed now. And uh, the information from the launcher. We can still see the, the, the sky. It's an amazing sky we have tonight. We're very, very lucky. Uh, the information from our launch is being picked up by the first ground station along its path, as we were saying Operation earlier, Nominal, Beatrice, uh, the station of Galio in Kourou. Uh, in mission control, uh, of course, everyone is uh, following uh, what, is, what is happening very, very closely. And you can follow on your screen here to the right uh, you can follow the altitude, distance, and uh, speed of our launcher, its trajectory on uh, that uh, yellow line to the right of your screen there. Nominal. So everything nominal, as uh, they're telling us in mission control. So back in Jupiter, uh, key figures uh, working on this mission, of course, uh, representing the European uh, Space Agency. We have Charlotte Besco. She is head of the ESA Kourou office, and she is the first woman uh, in this position. Uh, alongside uh, Charlotte, we have Daniel Neuenschwanda. He is director of space and transportation. And uh, representing the CSG, we have Marianne Clare. Uh, she took over as head of the CSG just nine months ago. And it is also the first time a woman uh, takes on this position. Coming up to another milestone, Alexandra. Second stage separation is confirmed. A few seconds of ballistic. And you will see in the coming few seconds the ignition. Ignition. Confirmed. Five seconds later, separation of the ferrule. And you can admire with this 3D simulation the SSMS structure with all satellite around. And we are now in outer space. We have. Uh, yes, we, ha we have uh, reached the uh, place where our passengers are no longer under any threat, and therefore we can get rid of the fairing. Yeah. So uh, our first separation scheduled in just over 35 minutes. Uh, earlier, we spoke to Fabrizio Fabiani. He is program director on this mission. He has been working very hard over the past months. Believe me, it has been an unprecedented challenge. Uh, this is what he had to tell us. On this mission, we have seven microsats on the upper part of the SSMS carrying structure and 46 nanosatellite hosted in the lower part called Hexagon. Let me 
spend some words about the seven microsats. First, the satellite to be separated is under contract and procured by rideshare provider Spaceflight Inc. The second one is NIMO HD, that is the first Slovenian satellite for Earth observation, designed and manufactured in collaboration between Space SI and Spaceflight Laboratory from the Institute for Aerospace Space Studies of the University of Toronto and will be operated by Space SI. The third one is UPMSAT-2, an in-orbit demonstration satellite with the goal to improve education, research, industrial spin-off and international cooperation. The project is led by Polytechnical University of Madrid. The fourth is GRGSAT C1, the first commercial satellite for GRGSAT Inc. of Montreal, developed by SFL on NEMO platform, whose mission is to measure greenhouse gases emissions. After that, on the main deck, we have ISAIL, the first first commercial satellite developed in partnership with the European Space Agency involving Ezard Earth as mission operator and Lux Space as prime contractor. NewSat-6, an Earth observation satellite built and operated by Satellogic, and ION SCV Lucas, a spacecraft designed and built by the orbit, able to transport several satellites into space and deploy them individually into precise orbital slots. And that was uh, Fabrizio Fabiani. He is mission director on this flight VV-16. Alexandra uh, here to tell us all about this mission tonight. We're coming up to one of the key moments. Yeah, the confirmation of the first stage separation. That's good. So we had three successive significant acceleration flight phases. We are now at Mach 11 uh, uh, above atmospheric threshold at 200 km altitude. And uh, this Zeta-9 uh, will have a fall down in, uh, in the ocean. And as we were saying, a Vegas path takes it uh, northwards. All along its journey, it is, of course, being followed by these ground stations. We mentioned uh, Galio. Uh, all the information is being sent uh, to the CVI, the real-time visual control. Uh, uh, tell us a little bit more about, because you, you've spent time in, this, uh, in the CVI, haven't you, for your job? Yes, yes, I was in front of the trajectory panels. So uh, I have a, a dedicated... Uh, um, dedicated for, for them as mm -hmm. uh, they are working on this uh, special flight. Uh, so CVI received by telemetry or flight uh, parameters uh, from all the ground tracking stations used for this mission. That is mean French Guiana, as you mentioned, Bermuda Island, Canada, South Korea, and Australia. So you can see it's, it's a wonderful international contribution under CNES responsibility. Absolutely, and we, we heard a confirmation that we were uh, acquired by Bermuda just over 40 seconds ago. And there we have uh, Marianne Claire, the uh, director of the CSG I was telling you about earlier. Alexandre, I think we're about to, did we hear confirmation from the DDO, the first Avum ignition? It is confirmed now. There we go. So <laughs> this, uh, this boost is mandatory to target uh, orbit uh, conditions defined by your perigee altitude greater than 120 km. And what happens during this uh, AVUM flight phase? So during this flight uh, phase, uh, Canadian uh, Saint-Hubert Telemetry Ground Station is acquiring data. So you have a, an overlap between Bermuda and Canadian uh, station. Mm -hmm. And this first boost is targeting intermediate orbit parameters when achieved the stage with cutoff. Thank you very much, Alexandre. I don't know what we'd do without you. So uh, a reminder, uh, this very first ride share mission for Ariane Space uh, on board Vega, 53 passengers on board, uh, three separations. Uh, let's hear more from our program director, uh, Fabrizio Fabiani uh, in Kourou. What we are looking at is the motion of the satellite separation that is going to happen in a few moments. On this mission, we will have three separations. First one involves the four microsats which are on the towers. The second batch involves the three microsats on the deck. And the last one, delayed by about 10 minutes and on a higher orbit, will involve the separation of all the 46 nanosatellites which are hosted in the canisters integrated onto the HEXA module. The canisters on this mission have several sizes and come from several manufacturers like ISIS, Tyvek and Astrophane. The main future of the canister is to protect the satellites during the launch and to eject the satellite into space when the separation command from the launcher reaches the opening mechanism that allows the satellite to get out. On this mission, we have satellites from 0.25 unit up to 6 unit, 
one unit is a cube having the dimension of a Rubik cube. In particular, we have 38 cubes set for commercial customers with different mission, ranging from Earth observation, Internet of Things, and in-orbit demonstration, and eight for institutional customers with mainly educational and scientific purposes. The separation sequence for such kind of missions is quite complicated because it has to assure no collision between cube sets. We have globally 21 customers from all over the world, and in particular from US, Canada, Thailand, South America, and many from Europe. I'm very proud to have worked with all of them side by side for about two years. It was a great experience to exchange with so many persons from different nationalities, cultures, and backgrounds. I personally learned much from all of them. It was a long and challenging journey, receiving a so huge amount of data from all the customers, putting them together, doing the mission analysis and making available the key data to the right person at the right time. It was a great teamwork. I'm so grateful to everybody for that. Thank you. So 53 passengers on board our launch uh, tonight, and among them, a few from North America. We're joined live now by uh, Stella Guillen, live from Washington, D.C. Stella Guillen is Arian Space's VP for Sales and Marketing. Good morning. Good evening, Stella. Good morning for us. Good evening for you. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Liz. So excited to be here. <laughs> uh, so, uh, we were talking about the North American market. What are the prospects for the SSMS on the U.S. market? Yes, yeah, so out of the 53 satellites, a lot of them are from the U.S. This is a market, the small satellite market has been growing tremendously, about 10 times since 2010. We consider small satellites between one kilogram to 400 kilogram, which equates about 300 satellites a year. So it's a significant market for us. And with the help of the European Space Agency and the L3 program, we have been able to uh, develop some um, carriers that can actually help us uh, uh, meet the demands of this market. So very exciting. And uh, tell us, what is Ariane Space's answer to that? What are your differentiators? So we are uh, actually very uniquely uh, positioned to, to meet this market needs. Um, uh, Ariane Space is a family of launch vehicles that complement each other. So that gives us the capacity to uh, basically offer launch services for any satellites, any shape uh, or mass of satellites to any orbit at any time. Today, we're launching to a LEO orbit, but we have other, uh, we're launching a uh, constellations to MEO. We are launching to geostationary orbits. We're having a lunar program, Reicher mission coming up on Ariane 6. So all kinds of flexibility in, uh, in orbits. And also our new vehicles, uh, Vega C and Ariane 6, will give us the flexibility or the capability to perform several boosts of the launch and that will allow us to give uh, a smart deployment schemes for customers um, uh, for rideshare missions and for constellations. We're also providing some financial schemes to uh, new entrants uh, in the market. Uh, that's uh, thanks to VPI and the European Investment Bank. Lots of flexibility and a very reliable uh, launch service. And so uh, as you were, you were mentioning Vegas C uh, to look forward to in 2021. Yes, we're very excited. Uh, there's a lot happening on Vega, and for the small satellite ma market and the Reicher um, uh, possibilities, we actually have coming up two uh, missions on the next six months that will allow us to put Reicher missions for CubeSat. So it's a great opportunity. We have an equatorial launch uh, Reicher mission coming up as well obviously Vega C and also on, uh, on Ariane 6 coming up as the, as the new launcher as well. And um, uh, in a few seconds, uh, maybe, yeah, you might have a, a message uh, for your partners tonight in a few seconds, Stella. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I, we, we know that every satellite mission has tons of people behind it and their hearts and hopes and everything goes with the day like today, the launch day. So we want to say thank you so much to our customers for the trust they put in us and, uh, and for the Vega team that has worked so hard and has uh, given us so much uh, passion and drive through the campaign. Thank you so much. 
Thank you very much for joining us. That was Stella Guillen live from Washington, D.C. Thanks, Stella. Thank you. And Back here in the studio in Paris, Beatrice has left us shortly in order to be able to respect social distancing rules. And Luce Fabregat, Arian Space Executive VP, has joined us. Thank you very much for being with us, Luce. Thank you, Bernice. Good you, morning. Good morning, indeed. Uh, you have returned from Kourou quite recently. Yes, two weeks ago, in fact, after the launch, the successful launch of Fire and Five. Congratulations. Thank you. And I'm very pleased to be, thanks to all the teams, in fact, and I'm very pleased to be here with you, almost at home, to, to follow this launch, uh, this Vega launch uh, today. Well, thank you very much. And while we were speaking, Alexandre, sorry, but uh, another milestone, the uh, Avum extinction. De la VOOM. You can hear now the, it's the first the Avum boost cutoff. Uh, so uh, we will start a slow maneuver to, to start a long ballistic phase with a dedicated uh, barbecue mode. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much uh, for this information. And uh, we're now going to be going to uh, some replay pictures of tonight's launch. It, you can never watch it too many times. And uh, this will be an opportunity for me to ask uh, our two guests here who've been around for a while and who've seen quite a few launches. Um, have you actually seen many of them with your very own eyes? Because you're probably most of the time sitting in mission control or exactly. somewhere else. Exactly. Unfortunately, I could see only twice launches. Uh, it's, uh, it's a gift when you are in, uh, in training. Uh, and uh, yes, it's impressive and forever in mind. Uh, but on the other side, on the other side, the land campaign job does not allow to, to rejoice in such a spectacle as you are dedicated to your work during the flight. Absolutely. So, same question goes to you, Lisa. I mean, you've been with Arian Space uh, for some time? For 15 years now. Mm -hmm. And as, uh, as for Alex, I've seen most of the launches from inside. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think I've, I have been lucky to see uh, around 10 launches from outside, Kourou and uh, Baikonur. And, and Baikonur as well. And Baikonur as well. And uh, I must say that from outside, it's really even more impressive uh, than from inside, even even though from uh, the mission center you can uh, hear the sound, the noise of the of the liftoff, and you can feel the vi vibrations. But for for outside, it's much more magical, and, and that's uh, I believe I will not uh, I will never be bla blasé about this uh, spectacle. Absolutely, it, it is true. I have experienced it myself, and and even within the Jupiter Control Center, it is unbelievable what you how you sense the yes. vibrations. Absolutely, I'm little envious about people uh, outside in French Guiana today. Yes, yes, they they are lucky to be there. Um, tonight's uh, mission marks uh, Vega's return to flight after more than a year, doesn't it, Luz? Yes, uh, we we were lucky. In fact, with uh, with the beginning of Vega, we had uh, 14 uh, success successes in a row, which is, a, which is a record for a new launcher in the world. And then uh, last year in July, we had this failure of, uh, of Vega, the first failure of Vega. But since, since then, we have, we have had performed a huge job, huge work with, uh, with ESA and Avio, our partners. And, uh, and now we are ready and uh, we, have, uh, we, have we have seen that uh, the, the launch is, uh, is uh, performing uh, perfectly. Uh, uh, with this uh, Z23, uh, that was uh, the, the issue that, that had the anomaly uh, last year. Thank you very much, Luce. And we're going to be going over to this short video of our Chief Technical Officer, Roland Lager, on Vega's return to flight. Today's return to flight mission is a result of a major effort of all the Vega community to overcome the failure of VV-15 mission in July last year, which occurred after an impressive series of 14 successful missions. Immediately after the flight, the European Space Agency and Iron Space set up an independent inquiry commission, co-chaired by ESA Inspector General Tony Tolkernison and myself as the Iron Space Chief Technical Officer. This commission was composed of independent experts from AVIO, ESA, CNES and ASI space agencies, along with representatives of the Italian and French ministries of defense. We worked during all the summer, analyzing all available telemetry data from the flight, 
with special focus on the propelled phase of the Zephyro 23 second stage during which the anomaly occurs. At the completion of this extensive and thorough process, we define one possible and most probable root cause. We identify a combination of weaknesses in the design, the manufacturing, and the control processes of the internal thermal protection of the Zephyro 23 casing forward dome. The conclusion of this comprehensive activity were delivered at the beginning of November 2019, with 20 recommendations out of which 14 were deemed mandatory and to be implemented before today's return to flight mission. In complement to the corrections of the anomalies that triggered the flight VV-15 failure, additional actions were defined, enabling to reinforce the robustness of the design and the production flow. All these recommendations were accepted by the ESA Qualification Authority, which took the lead for managing their implementation in close cooperation with Avio, the Vega prime contractor. Many thanks to everyone who contributed to this effort that will make the Vega launch vehicle more robust and the teams in charge of Vega launch system even stronger and more united. Thank you for your attention and go Vega. That was Arian Space's CTO, Roland Lagier. Uh, Alexandre, you uh, said earlier it's uh, Vega's rebirth tonight. Yes, it's a very important flight. Uh, yes, it's a rebirth after the 15 uh, anomaly and 11 months of uh, intense investigations. Uh, Vega had, uh, as mentioned by, by Luz, uh, 14 success in a row uh, since its first flight in 2012. And, but similar to all launchers that persist on the market, this painful step is inevitable. Uh, this is an integral part of the, of the launch system life. So anyway, we learn from this uh, failure, as mentioned by Roland, making us stronger than ever. Absolutely, and uh, as uh, Stéphane Israel was saying, it is also our very first rideshare mission. Yes, it's uh, for its rebirth, in fact, as was said by, uh, by Alex. Uh, Vega is, uh, is blazing uh, the trail with this uh, new rideshare mission, which is, uh, which is very important for give, providing new services to new customers, institutional uh, customers, institu answer institutional needs universities, which is also very important, and it was uh, mentioned by, uh, by uh, Beatrice also before, and private commercial uh, new entrance to this market that becomes affordable thanks to this uh, solution, SSMS uh, solution. Thank you very much uh, for that, Luce. Uh, uh, we're going to be going back to uh, mission control uh, shortly because, uh, of course, uh, Vega's prime contractor uh, is, of course, Italy's Avio. And we're going to be speaking to uh, Avio's CEO, Giulio Renzo. He's going to be joining us from mission control, uh, where they're all uh, very uh, concentrated on the mission tonight as uh, we're coming up in uh, just... Uh, over 17 minutes to the first uh, separation. Good evening, Mr. Renzo. Thank you for joining us. Can Good you hear me? Good evening to you. Thank you for uh, inviting me. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, so, of course, uh, as we've been saying uh, throughout the webcast, it has been quite a year, hasn't it? Yes, it has been a very challenging year. Uh, I think we started in March uh, with the expected return to flight. We were ready to go. But as you have probably noticed, we've been stopped by the uh, evidence of the pandemic. And so we were deferred to launch in June. But unfortunately, we hit again an exceptional uh, condition of a bad weather uh, condition. And so we were pushed back uh, to fly in early September. But here we are, and now we are, we are orbital at this moment. And of course, uh, it's also a first, it's a proof of concept flight. Can you tell us more about this new service? Yes, I think it's a first timer for Europe. It's the very first time we arrange a so-called rideshare mission. We're going to be taking 53 satellites to space all at once. with a very sophisticated technology that Avio has put in place uh, under the umbrella of an ESA program. Uh, to deliver this satellite to different parts in space, different places, with the help of very sophisticated technology. So we're very happy to, to, for this to open up uh, the new market for small satellites for Europe. 
And uh, as we were uh, talking about with uh, Stella Guillen uh, from Washington, uh, early 2021 is also going to see uh, uh, something new with Vegas C. Yes, indeed. Uh, this is the project we've been working on for the last four years. It's a new version of Vega, more powerful, with 2.3 tons uh, capacity in low Earth orbit as compared to 1.5 tons in low Earth orbit, which Vega has at the moment. So this will uh, provide customers with more cost competitiveness, so it will be increasingly more attractive for customers, and we will perfect certain technologies to a higher extent. So it's a, a very big night tonight for you and for your partners? Yes, of course. I will take this opportunity to thank the whole partnership of the European stakeholders. We've been working closely with the drone service provider Ariane Space and with the French Space Agency CNES as well as with the European Space Agency over the last few very challenging months. And if it was not for our partnership, we wouldn't be here today. So I think partnership is the name of the game tonight. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us. Uh, Avio CEO, uh, Mr. Giulio Ranzo, thank you very much. And we're actually going to stay uh, in mission control. Uh, we're going to uh, speak as well to Marino Franito. He is Arian Space's uh, 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 Sorry, he, he, he also uh, is part of the Ariane Space family. Uh, so Marino is going to tell us a little bit more about this very special SSMS uh, offer. Because, of course, Vega is the smallest, the youngest of the Ariane Space family. Uh, and Ariane Space looks back at 40 years of innovation, of which the SSMS is the very latest. Uh, so uh, Marino, are you there? Can, can you hear us in Mission Control? Marino Franito? Marino, hello. Yeah, hi, Liz. Good Thank evening. you very yeah. much for nice taking the time yeah. to be with us. Thank so, you. So, yeah. So, uh, tell us more about yeah, this. Yeah, uh, we're this new very happy service. to be here tonight. We're ha very happy that we have a lift off. Yeah. So, um, first of all, I have to say the Vega is a launcher which has been conceived for the to serve the, the small satellite market, and uh, it has performed uh, a series of very exotic missions since its introduction. And even if the, the let's say that it has mostly served um, uh, small satellites and uh, sun synchronous orbits, uh, and SSMS is uh, is a new uh, kind of exotic mission, but especially it's our new service to structure the, uh, the offer for the for the small satellite industry. So, as you all know, uh, Ariane Space has uh, structured the, the commercial market, has been the first uh, launch service provider in the world for the commercial uh, satellite market. Now, our um, ambition is also to structure the small satellite market and to serve the small satellite industry with a very reliable, affordable, and uh, regular service uh, to space. And how do you achieve such an affordable uh, service? Yeah, so um, our solution was based on, a, on a, um, streamlining, a, let's say, the integration of small satellites. We have performed for the very first time integration of satellites in Europe, in Czech Republic. Uh, we have simplified the contractual uh, clauses for our customers, and um, we have reduced a lot the integration time to the, to the launch vehicle. Now, it's clear that uh, I say all this, but... Uh, I have to. I also have to thank our customers for for being with us, for being with us tonight, and for having been with us for for this very long time in which we have suffered the delays and uh, and uh, and problems. So we want to start from from this point, from tonight, for for uh, for this mission tonight to establish this very regular service and uh, affordable and uh, reliable service for um, for our customers. I know. Good to see you. Uh, could you could you Over just <laughs> Lucy speaking? Yes. Could you just uh, maybe uh, say a word about the European <laughs> Commission, which is an important yeah, customer nice for, to see for you tonight? As well. 
Yeah, it's not only an important uh, customer. I mean, it's also a very important partner because we have to thank the European uh, Commission, the European Union, for, for being behind us. Uh, we probably w we wouldn't be here tonight with SSMS if the European Commission and the European Union had not backed us uh, on this uh, very ambitious program. And I think it's not only uh, helping Ariane Spass to achieve this, uh, this mission tonight, but it's uh, simulating the European uh, new space economy that we want to to want to to create and uh, to uh, to to make a very uh, very uh, established and uh, and um, uh, very well uh, organized uh, new space economy marino thank you very much for taking time out from your very busy schedule uh, to speak uh, to us i, I realize that uh, this is a we're coming up to about 10 minutes before the first separation so I'll, uh, I'll let you get back to your team and back to work, and uh, good luck yeah. with everything this evening. Thank you very much uh, for being with us, Marino Frenito. Th thank you, thank you, and let's cross our fingers for a bit longer. Bye. <laughs> bye bye, and uh, back, we'll be back with you uh, shortly in uh, mission control. Uh, so we're now less than 10 minutes away from our, our first uh, separation. Uh, this moment has been a long time coming, hasn't it, Luce? Yes, right. <laughs> so how do you feel so close to the goal? That's, that's really an exciting moment. And usually when, when I am in the, in the mission center, as, uh, as Marino and uh, Stefan are today, um, when we are with the CNES teams and the customer teams, uh, it, uh, it's, uh, you can feel uh, in these last minutes before the announcement of the separation, the, an atmosphere of uh, sharp and heavy concentration and uh, the center is, uh, is getting more and more silent, uh, expecting this, uh, this announcement. So it's, uh, it's really a crucial time uh, mm. in, the, in the launch, for sure. Yeah. And as you were saying to me, uh, just before we went live, a very, uh, a time when everything goes quite silent. That's right. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. More and more silent. Yeah. Uh, Lucy, you're going to be leaving us uh, for a short while, but you'll be back. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Alexandra, uh, could you please take us through the main events of the mission so far and what we can look forward to? Yes, and I will record the main phase for uh, morning spectators. <laughs> um, for those who are joining us. Yes. So who missed their alarm clock. <laughs> During the first phases of flight, the solid booster stages P80, Z023 and Z09 were tracked by the telemetry ground station Galio over a duration of 6 minutes and 30 seconds. Due to safety aspects, these three stages will re-enter in the seas. The last stage, integrating a liquid engine and named Avum, reach a transfer orbit after first boost duration of eight minutes. These boosts were tracked by Bermud and Canadian Saint-Hubert ground station. In order to make the first SS orbit circular, a shorter second boost of one minute and a half will occur under South Korean Jeju station visibility after a long intermittent ballistic phase of 20 minutes. Once the targeted orbit reach, the seven passenger on top of SSMS deck will be released for the second part of the mission, a short third of um boost will occur under Australian Lunersia station in order to start the target's 530 km SSO. And after one Earth rotation, a fourth of um boost will circularize the CubeSat injection orbit. Then, the separation seconds will be tracked by Bermuda ground station telemetry. Finally, the mission will end by a fifth of um boost and will re-enter in the ocean. The Vega Total Vega mission will last less than two hours. Thank you so much, uh, Alexandre, for all those details. And we are welcoming back here on set in Paris. Beatrice, thank you for being back with thank us. Good to you. <laughs> and uh, I think we're also uh, back in touch with our launcher, Alex. Yes, uh, we will be quite at the, the end of this uh, first uh, long ballistic phase. Um, Jesus is a... Uh, have to acquire because I, I'm, I'm waiting the confirmation. Ah, we're waiting for confirmation by the DPA. Exactly. Right, okay. Uh, but I can say just before, so uh, have to acquire the launch vehicle and the second of them boost. Uh, and this boost uh, have to occur in a couple of minutes to complete the, the first injection of it. So I'm waiting this, uh, this confirmation now. 
And uh, the data, as you were saying, is then being transmitted uh, as, as always. It's, it, during the, the non-visibility phase, it's stocked. And then as soon as we're back in visibility, all the data is transferred to your colleagues at the CVI. Just before. Waiting for confirmation in your earpiece. Yes, from CVI, I have confirmation that uh, Jeju uh, is acquired, the launcher. Yes, we have a confirmation done from the TDO. So yeah, just to answer to your question, all data is uh, recorded during this ballistic phase mm -hmm. and uh, it will be downloaded under this uh, South Korean uh, ground station. The South Korean uh, ground station, which gave us a big fright last night, didn't it? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, linked to, to, to the, the typhoon, but fortunately, today we launch with a, a better situation. Fantastic. And um, uh, so uh, as for the lower 46 uh, passengers, they were integrated in Europe for the very first time in the Czech Republic, uh, to be precise. So uh, we're going to uh, meet the team uh, behind uh, this company specialized in the launch services. But I think Beatrice wanted to tell us, first of all, about a, in, in a, a few seconds about a innovation that you had to think up. Yes, well, because uh, we need to, to think that uh, when the campaign was resumed end of May, we have very short uh, time. We we have just um, uh, 14 days uh, of uh, of uh, quarantine imposed in France Guyana, and also uh, we we'll have to come back. We'll okay, come okay. Back. I will, Sorry, I will ask. I will let after the video. After the video. <laughs> Thank yes, you. Sure. <laughs> Five years ago, we started with this amazing project called SSMS, multiple satellite launch system for Vega launch. To make access to space more affordable, we went even further. It is for the very first time when secondary payload is integrated directly on the spacecraft in Europe. For this purpose, we open dedicated laboratory, custom bonded area, where we can handle also non-EU customers. We provide this service through sub launch services, company from our group. Satellite customers are asked uh, to deliver their satellites here in Brno eight weeks uh, prior to the launch. After one week of uh, standalone operation, the populated deployer are uh, installed uh, on the hexagonal module of the SSMS. So five weeks prior to the launch, the assembly is picked up and is transferred by truck to the early airport. By a commercial plane, the assembly is transferred to, to French Guyana for the final operation for the assembly on the launcher structure. So uh, Beatrice, uh, uh, as we were saying just before the video, you were telling me uh, how you were uh, forced to become very creative. Yeah, in yeah. As period. I was saying, the, uh, in, in end of May we had a, a quarantine in French Guiana, and also some of the customers were not able to get the launch space because of the travel restrictions. So you're right. We needed to be innovative and and to create the way to perform the remaining operations on their behalf. And for that, uh, we establish a high quality process to strictly follow all the procedures that the customers provided, doing rehearsals, doing some trainings, and also for the first time using the, the smart glasses. And those glasses allow customers to, to remotely follow all the operations, to provide uh, instructions, drive the, those uh, operations. You can and see also, them right there on the screen behind, uh, yeah, Beatrice, there. behind me. Yeah. And also to, to assess the flight worthiness of the satellites before encapsulation. Absolutely. So, yeah, necessity is the mother of invention. Yes. In for unprecedented sure. times, you find unprecedented. We find a way to do it. Answers. Absolutely. Um, Alexander, we're uh, about to uh, come up to the separation. Can you please tell us how the separation occurs? Yes, the first, first satellite uh, will, be, will be released within a constant time sequence. All the separation relative velocities uh, were defined by tuning each separation device. Thanks to the time and velocity Deuxième factors, we assure safe separation for each customer. That means for this kind of right share mission, a complex separation strategy has to be put in place due to the number of satellites and the request to avoid any collision. And, uh, and now I have the confirmation of the second boost ignition. And this, uh, dura the duration of this boost will be one minute and a half. I recall the aim of this second boost is to circularize the, the, the final orbit injection. 
So uh, a lot of passengers tonight are from the biggest, which weighs 138 sure, kilos, I see here, uh, about the size of a small refrigerator, uh, down to our nano satellites in lower position, uh, which are no larger than a smartphone. Is that right? Yes, uh, you are perfectly right. And SSMX POC, the, the smaller spacecraft is, is roughly the size of this smartphone. So, and imagine if you stack 12 together, you can deliver a small constellation with only one separation order inside the same deployer track. But what can you do with such a small satellite? It's important to have in mind that if I would like to put this uh, uh, um, cell phone in orbit, with this 150 gram satellite has camera, GPS, and accelerometers covered by a long life uh, uh, battery. With this small device, I get a satellite with main function observation, localization, attitude diagnosis. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you for those explanations. And I have a confirmation mm -hmm. of the second level boost cutoff. So, what does this mean? That means that uh, it's a green light to separate first batch of satellites. So the separation uh, sequence will start. So as you can imagine, in mission control right now, all eyes are on the computers. Satellite separation coming up in less than 20 seconds. And as Luz was telling us earlier when she was here, a moment of, uh, of great silence and concentration uh, in mission control. Séparation Athéna. Separation are confirmed, the first true one on longitudinal direction and the first transversally. And there we go, we see some signs. Of course, this is the first of three separations, nevertheless. It has been a long time coming yeah. and we can see the expressions of joy there in Mission Please, Control. If you don't mind, I would like to add something. Please, Beatrice. Because uh, I'm personally touched by one of those separations, one of those satellites that has been developed and manufactured by the students of the University in Madrid where I made my engineering studies. Uh, so if I'm here today working in the space business, it's thanks to one of those projects. I would like to highlight the importance that the small satellite projects in the university has for, for creating new space engineers and also to thanks all the entities that provide the necessary support to make that happen. So thank you very much to all those actors. That is a very touching uh, testimony. Thank you very much for being here with us uh, tonight, Beatrice. You're going to be leaving us uh, now, and uh, we're going to be welcoming back uh, Luce Fabriget. Uh, but first, over to this film from the European Space Agency. Thanks to SSMS, or Small Spacecraft Mission Service, more than 50 satellites will be launched at once. This new dispenser has been developed by ESA and Avio and manufactured by Saab Aerospace in the Czech Republic. The European Commission is contributing to this proof-of-concept flight. Until now, the launch opportunities for the smallest class of satellites were limited as they typically had to make use of large satellite launches' spare capacity to get a piggyback ride to orbit. But the SSMS takes a different approach. The uh, Small Spacecraft Mission Service allows to perform dedicated launches, specific for and tailored for uh, small spacecrafts. In this way, this on one side, there is uh, the reduction of the launch cost, and on the other side, there is a maximization of the launch opportunities. The SSMS is composed of modular parts, such as a hexagon module, rods, towers and columns. These can be assembled in various configurations, depending on the requirements of the satellites that will be launched, offering a great versatility and the ability to accommodate any combination of customers. The payload integration for the lower part of the system is done in Europe by the SSMS manufacturer, reducing cost and effort for small satellite companies. The top-level satellites are added at Europe's spaceport in Kourou. Once in orbit, the satellites will be deployed in a coordinated fashion, after which the Vega upper stage, carrying SSMS, will de-orbit. Later on, this new dispenser will also be used for Vega C. 
offering an extra 800 kilograms of capacity and an enlarged volume within a wider launcher fairing, at the same cost as Vega today, flying even more passengers per individual SSMS launch with a significant cost reduction per kilo. An important development for Europe in an evolving launcher market. Today we are trying to uh, cover all the market needs that we have um, concerning launching uh, satellites into low Earth orbit. This SSMS um, service is uh, uh, today compatible both with the Vega as well as with the upgraded version of Vega called Vega C. In reality, we are today uh, uh, designing a generalized version of the SSMS for Vega C so that we will be able to launch any kind of combination of small uh, uh, spacecrafts in the future. And we are using uh, the opportunity that we have with the Vega to have a proof of this concept. For this maiden flight, SSMS will deliver all its passengers into the same sun-synchronous orbit at an altitude of 550 kilometers. But in the future, Vega could deliver its payloads on separate orbits with SSMS Europe is making its lightweight Vega launcher more versatile, thus providing new launch opportunities for small satellite manufacturers and operators at competitive costs. And joining us live now from Darmstadt in Germany, ESA Director General Jan Werner. Jan Werner, Herr Werner, hello. Uh, can you hear me? Hello. Thank you very much for... Hello joining us at this uh, very early hour. So as we were saying, the European Space Agency funded the SSS, um, SSMS hardware development and contributed with the European Union to the funding of this proof of concept flight. So what does this project represent for ESA? So this project for us is of course a very important one because it shows also flexibility, agility, and also cost reduction. So it's, uh, as you mentioned, this uh, very nice acronym SMMS, which means Small Space Spacecraft Mission Mission uh, Service, is, uh, is a very special case because we have uh, 53 satellites on board and coming from different sources, from different countries. So 13 countries, 21 customers. This is, of, of course, already something special, but also for us it's very important that it is returned to flight after the mishap of VV-15. It's a very important step for us uh, and also for the future of uh, using these, uh, also this launcher for many purposes. And uh, the flight comes, of course, amid unprecedented times. Uh, how did ESA deal with the effects of the coronavirus uh, lockdown? Yeah, the coronavirus lockdown was, of course, a shock for us. We started in uh, late February this year to observe the situation and to think about consequences for us. And then we went in total teleworking very early in March, uh, meaning all people, we sent home all people. That was possible for ESA because we are, have teleworking already as a normal action in our daily life. But of course, to send all people at the same time home was difficult. We could not and we should not send all because, for instance, uh, Kourou, we cannot uh, go back from the launch site. We had a similar situation with the uh, Satellite Operations Center in Darmstadt where we still needed people. The satellites were flying even with the virus. And also some of the test uh, laboratories uh, were continuing. But we reduced people dramatically and I can say they performed very well. We could even accelerate our payments to industry, which was very important at these times. But now we are back and this is good. Uh, as you're saying, uh, we're back. Luce Fabregat uh, is here uh, with us on set. Uh, I think you wanted to uh, ask uh, Jan Werner a question about... About the launcher, maybe, uh, yes, uh, Jan, because uh, it's, uh, it's also the, the, the return back to flight of uh, Vega. So what does it mean for, uh, for ESA, uh, according to you? Yeah, you see, first of all, for me personally, it's really a great relief that we saw this marvelous launch because you can understand if a launch does not work, it's already the director general who is guilty. That's very sure. If it's success, many people are there and uh, celebrating it, that's good. But if something happens, then, of course, I get immediately very bad reactions. And therefore, it's for me personally also 
a big satisfaction that uh, all people work together with Avio um, and also with ESA and uh, Ariane uh, Spass uh, to really make this flight a success and therefore I'm really happy about it. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, being with us uh, tonight or this morning, uh, Jan Werner, uh, Director General of Isa, thank you for joining us. That was Jan Werner live from Darmstadt in Germany. As we were saying, a unique EU Isa cooperation. So we're going to go straight over to uh, this interview with Pierre Delso from the European Commission. The European Commission considers that this experience is extremely important because actually we want to use this experience to launch new satellites and small satellites and to test small satellites in orbit. And uh, from that point of view, developing this kind of technology is, if, is a fundamental for us because we believe that in the future this technology will continue to grow in, the, in Europe but also elsewhere in the world. And we want Europe to remain competitive and to be part of this uh, development. So from that point of view, uh, the European Commission is very keen, actually, to, to have this kind of testing in orbit with the new Vega launch. And of course, for that, the cooperation with ESA is fundamental for us, because we really believe that it's important that all of us work together to develop this uh, type of technologies in Europe. In this particular case, the Commission has been quite ambitious, because we financed more than 11 million euros to, for this launch. And actually, what we want to test is actually the possibility to have uh, small satellites being launched and being tested in orbit. We really believe that small satellites are a key factor and key players in the future of the uh, space sector in Europe and elsewhere also, and we want Europe to play a very important uh, role in this sector. If I knew about the future, you know, but I can tell you at least that the current Horizon 2020 program will be replaced by a program which is called Horizon Europe, which is not yet completely final because we still don't know the amount of money which will be available for this program, for this research program. But what I know is that space will continue to be financed through this uh, research program, Horizon Europe. And of course, in this context, as the European Commission, we will continue to work with our key player, uh, ESA. And certainly, we, will, we are now working on how to establish our future relationship with ESA in a global context, not only, of course, for research, but also for the flagship programs like Galileo and Copernicus. And we're coming up to our second separation of the three remaining passengers, uh, the small satellites on the main deck. Can you tell us more, Alexandre? So, um, yes, we will uh, release three, uh, three uh, satellites. The two both satellites will be released simultaneously, and the last one only 80 milliseconds later. Uh, so, uh, linked to the strategy, as I mentioned before, of the relative velocity and uh, timeline uh, sequence. I have a confirmation that we are under New Norcia Ground Station telem telemetry. So, New Norcia in Australia. Australia. Yes. Absolutely. So, this is uh, the last one, the last station. Yes. Uh, indeed, we were obliged to wait this acquisition. To, to perform uh, um, the next satellite release, so the three one that I mentioned before, because all active phases, including mm -hmm. separation, have to be tracked by a ground station under French law. Uh, so you know, uh, all launch provider launching from French Guiana have to be able to, to give and, uh, and justify launcher data during these critical phases, which are the propulsion separation one. And thanks to, I would, I would like to add a thanks to CNES teams for this uh, for their involvement on these uh, important topics for us, uh, from mission design, in fact, up to the flight monitoring, as is uh, today, and uh, of course, uh, the operations in French Guiana. And here we have it. Oh, you yeah. should see Alexandre. <laughs> Yes, the mission is not, is not finished, but uh, I'm, I'm very happy with these uh, seven microsatellite uh, separations. So that's it. The second separation are three remaining passengers on the main deck. Uh, here in Mission Control, behind the masks, happy faces all round. <laughs> I, can, I can tell you so much, yes, smiles <laughs> loose. S smiles behind the masks. We can imagine, yes, of course, uh, this is not the end of, of the mission, as was said by, uh, by Alex, of course, uh, but already long life to our first uh, seven uh, babies uh, already separated. Mm -hmm. They have lived together for a few months. Uh, on ground and uh, during the flight right now. Longer than usual. Longer than was yes. scheduled, of course, but uh, each of them is now starting a, 
its individual journey and uh, we wish uh, we wish each of uh, each of them a uh, long life uh, in space and you were going to tell us about uh, one uh, of those satellites in particular, Alexandra? Yes, there is a, another one, a proof of concept uh, inside this flight. It's uh, like a Russian doll. Uh, it's already mentioned. A Russian by, doll? What do you mean by that? Uh, with, uh, with uh, you know, the... The, um, the, the, uh, the, the dolls and the you dolls can... Uh, yes, for, a smaller from, one from inside. Moscow, yes, yes with a lot of piece inside. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's quite the, the, the same fellow because this satellite is loaded with a, a dozen of, uh, of tubes sat inside. It's a demonstrator, and the aim of this new concept is, uh, in fine, to be able to move uh, to move satellites to different orbits and altitudes independently of the launcher life. Mm -hmm. It's the future. Absolutely, it's the future. Well, uh, Luce, uh, forty-six satellites uh, separating uh, next. Right. In, in three, less than three less minutes, than three minutes. It's, it, will, uh, it will be a record for Has Ryan that been space. done before? No, it will be the first time for Ryan Space. First time for Ryan so. Space. So a lot of firsts tonight. You're right, yes. Some, yes, uh, some mission this is tonight. Uh, we'll shortly be going uh, back to Kourou to hear from Ariane Space CEO uh, Stéphane Israel after this uh, second successful separation. Uh, Ariane Space has been launching from French uh, uh, Guiana, from the Guiana Space Center, for 40 years. So let's uh, watch uh, this film uh, marking Ariane Space's 40th anniversary. Ariane 1, the first launch vehicle designed in Europe, lifted off for the first time in December 1979. It drew on France's preliminary work on the Diamond rocket and was designed from the outset for geostationary launches. This made it perfect for the growing communications satellite market. Europe quickly capitalized on this opportunity in 1980 by founding Orion Space, the first commercial space transport company. and this new launch service provider would rapidly carve out its own market segment. The first member of the Ariane family logged 11 launches between 1979 and 1986 for both government and commercial customers. For instance, Ariane 1 was chosen to launch Giotto, the European Space Agency's first deep space mission, which flew by Halley's Comet. With this success under its belt, ESA quickly developed Ariane 2 and 3. These were more powerful, in line with the growing size of telecom satellites. Ariane Space would carry out 17 missions with these two launches. From 1982 to 1989, Ariane 3 added the ability to perform dual launches, sending two satellites at a time towards geostationary orbit, and this technique would quickly become the hallmark of Ariane Space. At the end of the 1980s came Ariane 4, a launcher that used the same basic design as its predecessors, but was even more capable. In particular, it was modular, with six different versions, and it was a spectacular market success. In 15 years, this new rocket would carry out 116 launches for customers from around the world. The launch base in Kourou, French Guiana, was a beehive of activity throughout the 90s, regularly reaching a rate of one launch a month. Because of this rocket's capabilities, Ariane Space captured fully half of the global market for commercial launches. Ariane 4 was retired in 2003, passing the baton to the newest family member, Ariane 5. This heavy launcher featured a different design, but brilliantly carried on the tradition of its older brother. Once again, the idea was to boost its power to handle increasingly hefty telecom satellites while also maintaining the strategy of dual launches into geostationary orbit. At the same time, Orion Space decided to expand its family by offering launches on the storied Soyuz rocket from the Guiano Space Center. This service started in 2011 and would notably support the deployments of Europe's own satellite navigation system, Galileo. Orion Space also teamed up with the Russian Space Agency to offer Soyuz launches from the Baikonur Cosmodrome, operated by Starsem, a joint European-Russian company. 
During the first decade of the new millennium, ESA chose this solution to launch its Mars Express and Venus Express spacecraft. Then in 2012, Orion Space introduced a new light launch vehicle, Vega. Developed by Avio at the initiative of Italy, Vega clearly showed Europe's expertise in solid propulsion. Despite its small size, Vega has already carried some very prestigious payloads. In 2015, for instance, it lofted ESA's IXV re-entry demonstrator. That same year, it launched Lisa Pathfinder, a proof-of-concept demonstrator that will enable ESA to design and launch a huge space-based laser interferometer to detect gravitational waves. With this trio of launches, Orion Space now had a complete family capable of handling all types of missions, whether into low, medium, or geostationary orbit. Orion 5 has now been in operation for 24 years, more than half of Orion Space's lifetime. It has carried out over 100 missions, including some very prestigious ones for the European Space Agency. For instance, it launched the XMM Newton X-ray Observatory, sent Rosetta to study the comet 67PTG, propelled Bepi Colombo on its way to Mercury, and also sent ATV pressurized cargo vessels to the International Space Station. While it's now reaching end of life, Orion 5 has yet to say its final word, since it will shortly be orbiting the eagerly awaited James Webb Space Telescope. To date, Soyuz has carried out 23 missions from the Guiano Space Center and Vega 15. As it hits 40, Orion Space must now tackle new challenges. Competition has grown fiercer over the last decade, while market pressure has driven down prices and the pace of innovation continues to accelerate. Satellites are changing as well, in line with new uses. Communication requirements have exploded, meaning that current terrestrial networks will have to operate alongside low-orbit constellations capable of providing anywhere, anytime internet access at affordable prices. High-resolution Earth observation satellites are set to revolutionize our understanding of the environment. Research, agriculture, maritime traffic management, and even finance could well benefit from imaging that's refreshed several times a day using special satellite constellations. In other words, there's no lack of launch opportunities. Spaceborne objects will be increasingly diversified to address a wide range of needs. Not only space probes and telescopes to help us better understand the universe, but also programs designed to make life better on Earth, with space applications that benefit everybody. The Orion Space family is evolving to address these changes, thanks to teamwork with our space agency partners. A new version of our light launcher, Vega C, is ready to enter service. The prime contractor, Avion, has boosted performance and fitted it with a larger fairing, so it can continue to support the government market as well as the booming SmallSat segment. Europe's light launcher will also feature a new modular satellite dispenser, allowing it to carry several dozen SmallSats on a single flight. Moving to the heavyweights, Orion 6 will soon be in operation. The new Orion Space Family flagship will combine the power of Orion 5 with the modular design of Orion 4. Offered in two basic versions, it will be highly versatile. Orion 6 could also address the small sat market, for example, on missions shared with geostationary satellites. Its new restartable upper stage will make Orion 6 especially effective in the deployment of mega constellations. What's more, its capabilities will allow Europe to reach brand new destinations such as the Moon or launch interplanetary missions. Of course, dual launches into geostationary orbit are still on the agenda. To ensure its cost competitiveness, Orion Group, the industrial prime contractor for Orion, has totally revamped its industrial organization and added innovative new processes such as 3D printing. The space transport industry is undergoing a deep transformation, which means that Ariane partners are already thinking about the post-Ariane 6 era, with a project called Ariane Next. Ariane Group is already working on a new rocket engine, dubbed Prometheus. 
It will be reusable and burn methane, while also significantly lowering production costs. At the same time, two reusable launch vehicle demonstrators, Callisto and Temis, will be undergoing initial tests in the coming years. 40 years on, Ariane Space is more than ever a key to European space strategy. We continue to deliver independent access to space for European agencies and governments, while also providing satellite operators from around the world with proven launch service excellence. So, as promised, we're going to go back live to Kourou, to Mission Control, to speak to Ariane Space CEO, Stéphane Israel. Good evening again, Stéphane. Good morning for us. So good, good to see you How again. You? So we just witnessed a few minutes ago two separations for the seven uh, main deck passengers. Uh, with this launch, Ariane Space will have reached the 700 satellite mark. Uh, is that right? It's uh, another first tonight? Yes, it is another first. So now we are going beyond these uh, 700 satellites uh, deployed by Ariane Space uh, since uh, its foundation. So it is also uh, another premiere of tonight. It's uh, right. And uh, I'm, I'm sure it's an opportunity for you as well to uh, send a message to all the partners you've been working so hard with uh, on this particular mission. Yes, I want uh, really to start by uh, thanking our uh, customers uh, for uh, this uh, flight. So now we have had a success for uh, the seven first satellites. We need uh, to wait a little bit for the 46 uh, which are coming. And you know it will be very exciting because we will have 26 uh, injections to separate them with uh, just a few uh, seconds uh, back to back. So it will be very exciting. It will be in a few minutes. But I want to thank uh, our customers. They are coming from, uh, as we have said, uh, 13 different countries. And we have 21 customers. So really thank thank a big thank for all of them and for sure i want to thank uh, our partners uh, this success tonight is a success of a team it's a european team our prime contractor is uh, avio based in colleferro in italy we have uh, the support of uh, isa for this mission for the european commission as well so tonight uh, it is really uh, the success of uh, europe and i want to thank uh, all our partners and i shall not forget uh, iron space team uh, who has made uh, terrific Job tonight as well. And of course, as you were saying, the mission is not yet over, so uh, we're going to be able to follow the rest of the mission on social media, right? Yes, so you can follow it on social media, you can follow it uh, on uh, Iron Space uh, Twitter, and uh, we will uh, communicate as soon as the mission uh, will be over, uh, which will be uh, now in a uh, few uh, minutes. And uh, when can we expect you to see you again, uh, either in Kourou or here in Paris for the next mission? Yes, so uh, we uh, will be back in uh, Guyana, in French Guyana, mid-October. It will be the 16th of October. It will be a launch uh, with uh, Soyuz. And uh, I think it's also a great symbol of our uh, family of launchers. We have just done uh, Ariane uh, mid of August. And now we are with Vega tonight. And next month, it will be uh, the turn of Soyuz. We have a great family of launchers, and uh, they will deliver for all our customers. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we wish you good luck for uh, the end of the mission in Kourou. We'll let you get back uh, to work. Thank you for joining us again, uh, Stéphane Israel, CEO of uh, Ariane Space. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, so, uh, Luz, uh, mid-October, the next, uh, the next uh, mission that you're already working on, obviously. Yes, in six weeks. From now already, I hardly dare to speak about this older brother of, uh, 
of Vega today because uh, I think that uh, the, the mission is ongoing and uh, and uh, it will be such a great relief at the end of this Vega uh, Vega mission and I think that uh, all the teams will uh, will enjoy and uh, start to enjoy and celebrate this success. But it's true that at I in space and uh, with our Russian partners and uh, with CNES uh, teams uh, in uh, at, uh, at uh, in French Guiana, we have started to to. We have started the operations and we have started to work uh, to prepare this uh, Soyuz launch in, uh, in six weeks from now. So uh, we hope to see you either here in Paris or in Kourou uh, in six weeks' time. Uh, as we were saying, it is, uh, it is getting uh, quite late or rather early here in Paris, so we'll be uh, ending the webcast shortly. But of course, you can follow our social media team. We'll be holding you by the hand and taking you through right to the end of uh, this mission, and uh, Alexandra is going to take us through uh, the main stages that uh, we'll uh, be able to follow uh, as well. Thank you, Alexandra. Yes, yeah, so uh, it's important to note that the third avion boost occurred uh, before the loss of Nunarcia uh, ground station, so everything goes nominally. So, uh, customer time mine will end by releasing uh, um, the, the 46 additional uh, passengers, so the 46 CubeSat. Uh, 15 kilometer higher after a very small uh, two short boost with the Avum uh, and after that uh, uh, be between these two short Avum boost you will have a, a long a long ballistic phase so uh, it's important to note that a dedicated sequencer uh, is uh, is on board and uh, will send uh, the the separation orders within 160 second duration for the 46 CubeSats. And all the second order and separation direction, of, of course, were optimized to, to guarantee for each customer safe condition at injection. It is not, I recall, it's not so easy for 46 CubeSats within a short duration uh, below 200 seconds. Well, thank you very much uh, for those explanations. Uh, so uh, this should be happening in a few dozens of uh, minutes from now. Yeah. And uh, of course, um, we'd like to say a very big thank you to the teams both here in Paris and of course the teams in Kourou that have made it possible to bring you this live webcast. A big thank you as well to our interpreters who've brought you the entire uh, webcast in real time in French, uh, Marc Fermin and Alexandre Carayon. So uh, thank you very much, Alexandre, for being at our side all evening and taking us through all the key moments. Thank you for this opportunity. It was uh, really a, a pleasure to be here this morning. Thanks a lot. And uh, Luce, thank you very much. We uh, hope to see you again sort of in six weeks time then. Thanks for a lot to you, Liz. Yes. The next Thanks. launch. Uh, so a big thank you to everyone this evening. And uh, please uh, stay connected on social media. Stay with us. And we'll see you again very soon. We're going to leave you now with some uh, beautiful pictures of uh, replay of tonight's launch. And we'll see you back here very soon. Allumage et décollage.